disregard evidence that points in, 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 in any other direction. Um, there is in this case widely publicized evidence both for and against the mental illness uh, um, explanation of the acts of Jared Loughran. It won't be until the trial that people actually learn enough accurate facts to make any kind of informed judgment about whether or not uh, uh, what we call, met, what some people call mental illness had a causal um, uh, effect on the behavior and how much of a causal effect it had. I also want to make the point that killing changes people. Uh, if any of you know police officers who have had to kill people in the line of duty or if you have friends that have served in the military, some of the people who have been torn apart by post-traumatic stress disorder, it wasn't because of their life being in danger. It was because they feel differently about everything having killed another human being. So the Jared Loeffner that gets examined after these incidents may not be exactly the same as the Jared Loeffner prior to those incidents. Um, and and I, that's, I can only say it that way again because I never examined the guy and most of the people who talk about it have no idea what they're talking about. Um, so be careful about that. Um, to tell the truth, one, one of the points I think is incredibly important is that, is that ad, advocacy that spun is tends to be ineffective over time. The truth is, all, in my opinion, almost always the best form of advocacy. And some of the truths are things you're not that crazy about. Um, so it would be nice to say that there is no relationship between what we call mental illness and violence. And I think the general consensus among social scientists is that's not true. Now, it is true that it's a relatively small relationship and it, it, it applies to a, a small subgroup. And you should say that too. But if you overdo it in the other direction, it can be counterproductive because people say it, it, it flies in the face of people's common sense. 
Um, we did a, um, I helped the um, uh, Council of State Governments and NASHTA to develop a, a publication that I think Susan has made available to all of you, which is a toolkit of how uh, state mental health directors can better respond to these kinds of public spectacular tragedies without making it worse, how they can advise governor's offices about how to not say things that are gonna make it worse in the heat of the moment after these tragedies. Uh, but, but the main point is that we want good information about real risk, both what is a real risk and what's not a real risk, rather than an exaggerated or extreme statement on one side or the other, which in my opinion over time is less credible. So one of the questions that I was posed, to, by the way, if you want to read what I said in detail about these questions, the American Psychological Association, if you Google my name, they still have, the, I wrote five answers to these questions after the hearing. One was, given the fact that most people with mental illness are not dangerous, what are signs that often distinguish dangerous individual? And what should a person do if he or she knows someone who, who uh, exhibits these signs of danger? And what I said was, some of the, I'm going to do this fast because you know most of this. Most people with mental illness don't pose a danger. It's very easy to predict things after they happen. Um, and Niels Bohr was uh, famous for saying that it's really hard to predict things, especially the future. <laughs> but it's easy and wrong to overgeneralize from the characteristics of known offenders. And the, the exaggerated example of that is that drinking water causes serial murder. Because no serial murderer has ever not ingested water prior to the, to the serial murder. So if you look at people after you know what they did, and then generalize from some facet of them, it's almost always going to be incorrect. Uh, it, it certainly lacks predictive validity. If you're, if you're, I was on a national TV show right after the shooting. And this obnoxious creep who uh, <laughs> refers to himself as an FBI profiler, which actually he wasn't, um, says, well, you know what really bothers me, Dr. Phil, is that uh, uh, the signs were all there and nobody put them together. Translation, I would have been smart enough to predict this. <laughs> Except I don't remember getting a phone call from this Yahoo telling me, Jared Loft was going to shoot anybody. And luckily, I had told them the night before they do this long pre-interview, and I said, whatever you do, don't ask me what I think of what that guy just said, because I'm not going to lie on national television. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so I said, what do you mean? And I told them my problem with those kinds of statements. So what they did, it was really clever, they scripted the host with what I had said in my pre-interview. So he's reading off of the teleprompter after the guy predictably makes this obnoxious statement. And the host says, well, but aren't there like tens of thousands of people with those same characteristics who aren't gonna hurt anybody? And he went, and I, I swear to God, I'm not making this up, he went, well, yeah. <laughs> Behavior that I used to say in teenage Kids. <laughs> so all this means is that profiles are, are, are not very useful in predicting rare events because the, the things that people have in common are very common. So that any profile over identifies lots and lots of people and you don't know which of them is going to do something really horrible. So what do you do? Do you, you just hope for the best? What we can do is it's very easy to identify troubled people in troubling situations, in workplaces, in universities. And so what you do is you get people help because they need help, not because you know which one of these hundreds of people that need help is going to do something stupid. You help people because they need help. And in the process of it, you're going to probably prevent bad things from happening, but you won't know. You won't know what someone would have done had they not received the help that they needed and got. But you, you take away this pool of people who need help and aren't getting it. Um, uh, and you do it certainly first with kindness and common sense. Now I realize 
there's a lot of reasonable disagreement about whether there's any role for involuntary civil commitment or not. But one thing that just seems incredibly obvious to me is that it's cruel to use coercion with a person who gladly would have accepted user-friendly help. It's ridiculous. It's wasteful of resources. It doesn't work as well. It's stupid. So the idea, then, is to get people user-friendly help. And if we need to argue about what to do with the people that refuse help and scare us, I'd much rather have that argument than to start using it preventively for the hundreds of people hoping to prevent one of them, and we don't know who it is, from doing something wrong. So that's the gist of that argument. It also says that if you're going to use the Loeffner incident as an excuse to increase mental health funding, my suggestion is to focus on what would have mattered, which is crisis services. There's no evidence whatsoever that an increased mental health budget overall from the state of Arizona would have affected him very much at all, at least not that I've heard so far. And I don't know whether or not better crisis services would have mattered in that case. I really don't. I don't know enough yet, but it's possible. But certainly when you look at incidents of extreme violence, it's much more common that it is an episodic crisis that has some emotional component than that it's a person with what might be called a serious mental illness or has an ongoing psychiatric label. So to focus on what's often called SMI is probably going to prevent less violence than focusing on episodic crises that can happen to anybody. Loss of a job, acute depression, loss of a loved one, loss of a pet. People get very depressed and sometimes do things that they wouldn't do when they were not in crisis and they need help. They asked me about vitriolic political rhetoric, and the only reason I'm showing you this is because I'm very proud of this slide. That's Sean Hannity and that's Keith Olbermann. I fear I'd offend everybody at once. Some of you probably like Keith Olbermann. I just don't like people. I bought my daughter a t-shirt when she was 13 that said, Mean People Suck. And I like this one too. This is Will Rogers who said, Everybody is ignorant, only on different subjects. Mark Twain who said, All you need in this life is ignorance and confidence. Then success is sure. Fictional Forrest Gump who said, I'm not a smart man, but I know what love is. And the best quote ever was, of course, from Roseanne Roseanne. She said, It's always on something. So I also, I'm not going to go over this in the interest of time because we don't have too much time. But if you are interested, I'll be happy to talk with you about what parents can and should do in the aftermath of these incidents. And the two most important points of that are, don't lie to your kids and don't, there is such a thing as an unexpressed thought. Don't flood them with all the information you can think of. Let them guide you with their questions, but don't lie to them. The worst thing in the world for a kid after a crisis is to believe that they can't trust the people they rely on for life to tell them the truth. One other thing I would just point, the first bullet here, don't apologize normal responses to human trauma. Susan wrote a really terrific law review article that maybe some of you didn't like, but I think it's one of the best law review articles I've ever read, talking about why rape trauma syndrome is a bad idea because it takes perfectly sensible things that women do in the aftermath of rape and calls them a name that implies pathology. And I would say the same thing about when your kids act nervous after a community tragedy of epic proportions, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the kids. It's a perfectly sensible way to act after you're scared to death. Okay, this is the last point. How can community leaders help individuals who may have been traumatized by this tragedy? And this is not people who are labeled. I mean, this is anybody who had trouble dealing with this, and it was pretty much the same list of stuff as it is for kids. It's also a very bad idea to tell people what they're going to experience. When they say, 
okay, you're going to have PTSD and you're going to have flashbacks and you're probably going to have a lot of trouble sleeping. If you want to ruin somebody's night, walk up to someone just randomly and say, hey, you're going to have trouble sleeping tonight. I guarantee you they'll hate you because they won't get any sleep that night wondering why you said that to them. And, and uh, human responses to trauma have a lot of variety. They have some consistencies, but they have a lot of variety. And not everybody responds to things in the same way. Um, uh, the dangers of prevention from the perspective of consumers. When you try to prevent these rare events from happening, you have so many false positive ideas that you end up with preventive detention, which not only wastes people's freedom, but it also wastes money. Um, uh, it takes away people's freedom to fail so that that people who are sort of, you know, making their way in the world like me and you and along the way, we learn a lot of things from the mistakes that we make. But when you're when you're labeled and you're the subject of prevention, every uh, um, error takes on far more meaning than it deserves, and you're literally, your right to make little failures is taken away from you, which makes it very hard to recover and grow as a human being. Um, the, this presumption of coercion, which is often based on very weak predictive models, so that we always coerce more people than, if you could agree on who deserves to be coerced, it's always way more people than that that get coerced. And, and, and my psychiatrist friends get mad at me for saying this, but in the history of psychiatry, I'm unaware of any time that coercion has been used less than it could have been used. So, so I'm scared of any broad strokes increase in coercion, not because I don't know anybody who needs to be coerced, because I do, but because it gets overused so much. Um, and, and then he's last two, Will Rogers once said, diplomacy is the art of saying nice doggy until you can find a rock. And, and to, to many consumers, you know, at least what they've said to me is that, is that the, the presence of easy coercion stops people from trying to, to convince you of things in the way that people normally get each other to do stuff through persuasion and provision of information. And we have some, some data with that, with, with these lawsuits that had to do with the rights of patients to refuse medication. When Rivers versus Cats came down, the number of people who voluntarily medicated did not change a year later in, in one of my hospitals in Europe, in a study. But I, but I interviewed a bunch of patients and they all told me, every single one of them said, after Rivers came down, the doctors talked to us more. <laughs> because the doctors believed it was they were wrong, but they believed it was harder to involve their own medical. So that's another reason why coercion as a response tends to um, decrease the kind of persuasive communication that's much more helpful to people who are trying to recover. Um, that, that's too big to um, uh, And then just to repeat, you get people help because they need help, not because you know what they're going to do if they don't get it. Um, and that's, that's it for now, then I'll be able to do that and then we'll have Thank you for it.